Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 21 Hats podcast. I'm Lauren Feldman, your host. Every week, I sit down with three business owners to talk about the challenges they're facing. It's the kind of conversation you don't often hear in public. Our panelists address difficult topics like why their business isn't making as much money as they think it should, why their digital marketing isn't working, or why exactly they hired their brother-in-law. Owning a business can be a lonely and isolating pursuit, but at least you'll know that you're not the only one facing these issues. Got a question you'd like us to address? Send it to us and follow us on Twitter at 21 underscore hats or on our website, 21hats.com. Let's meet the 21 Hats podcast team. With us this week are Karen Clark Cole, who is CEO of Blink UX, a digital research and design firm based in Seattle. Jay Goltz, who has several businesses in Chicago, including a picture framing shop, artist's frame service, and Jason Home, a home furnishing store. And Laura Zander, CEO of Jimmy Bean's Wool, a digital version of a neighborhood yarn shop that is based in Reno, Nevada, but who's joining us today from Texas. Uh, Laura, we're going to start with you. You've had a lot going on lately. In the last couple of weeks, you've been to Vietnam, China, and Texas. What's going on? You know, as you mentioned, we're the digital version of a yarn shop, um, and we also have a retail brick and mortar store. Um, and it has been a crazy couple of years trying to figure out how to survive in this retail market. So what we are doing and hoping it will work is we have started to acquire some of our suppliers and some of the brands that we sell um, to increase our margin, to be able to do some of the design um, and kind of reimagine some of these brands and give some of these brands new life. So we bought in May a company that made knitting organizers and um, crochet organizers that was uh, based in Vietnam. So I went to go um, visit my partner there. And then I bought a company that does all the manufacturing out of China last year. Um, and so I've been visiting China frequently and manufacturing different handbags for knitters and crocheters there. Was that a company you had a relationship with? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's the, it's the knitting industry. It's the yarn industry. And so you become friends and having been in this for 17 years, um, it's a creative industry. And I've ha- had lots of friendships with most of the suppliers that, and most of the brands that we carry. So when it came time for them to step down, like the bag company, she got a divorce. And so they had to close the business because it was her, her husband and her sister-in-law that owned it. Um, The organizer company, she was a CPA by trade and not a knitter. And when her lease came up after 10 years, she just decided to go back to, you know, the corporate world. Um, And we had been friends and had spent lots of time together. And so she she called and asked if we would take it over. And then um, on Wednesday, I bought our biggest supplier, which is a yarn company based in Texas, and they hand dye yarn here in Texas. Um, the owner has been ill, um, developed MS about a year ago, and has just not been able to just, I mean, not been able to come to work um, and particularly on a regular basis. So they needed to, I asked them if I could possibly take over. Um, and I did as of Wednesday. Laura, so, you claimed before that you wanted to stay small. That doesn't sound very small. <laughs> it is small in the grand scheme of things. We're not you. Yeah. Uh, you know what? That's amazing. I love it. You started this by saying, and I wanted to put some more meat on these bones, you said survive the retail market. Yes. What I'm in. So you, you'd have to understand that this isn't about wanting to grow big. Oh. It's about changing your business to stay relevant and have a business model that you're still in business. So yep. you can't afford to just sit tight because the world's changing. I'm going to assume that when you say survive the retail world, I'm assuming you're getting lots of online competition now. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And a lot of the brands that we've historically carried are disappearing. You know, people are either aging out, they're tiring out, and they're um, the new brands that are coming up to take their places are all selling direct. You know, so we just and a lot and some of the brands that we've carried for years and years, and let's say somebody that we've sold fifty thousand dollars worth of their product in a year, well, they're now going direct because that's what they need to do to survive. And they're cultivating direct relationships. And so our sales for that brand are down to $10,000. You know, our revenue has gone down. Um, so how do I replace that? And we're discovering that we're, we have to figure out how to replace it on our own. 
so the answer is it's not that you're growing you're evolving which is that's brilliant so, see i think what you're saying is you're not growing you're evolving and it's the same thing i had to go through in that years ago 20 years ago already i started importing frame moldings from italy and spain and now I have a wholesale business that sells to a thousand frame shops around the country because I have access to stuff that they don't have and we're we're getting more design driven and I'm just probably 10 years ahead of where you're at because you just started getting pressure from the internet. I've had pressure from baby boomers basically slowing down the framing they were doing. So Laura and Jay, how are you guys funding these acquisitions? I didn't have any acquisitions. I just did it from internal organic growth. Okay. Laura? Huck's college fund. <laughs> Huck is your son. Yes. Your college fund? Wow. <laughs> and he's 10, so it had gotten kind of big. Yeah, um, actually, great question. Um, this is the first time that we've had to go to the bank. Um, and we just took out, we're taking out a loan. That's great. Yeah. Well, it's great that you're not giving away equity. It's kind of great, and it's maybe not great, but it is what you got to do. Yeah, we've just personally reinvested back into the company, um, but we're going to transition. You know, we just got out. We just took a small PayPal, like they have, you know, capital that you can take, uh, and then you just pay it um, based on your PayPal sales. They just take, I think, like thirty percent of your sales to pay it back. Wow. So, yeah, we've, we're going to borrow a little bit. We're going to leverage a little bit so that we can reduce our personal risk just a teeny bit. That's how we're and doing it. Have you considered uh, getting some VC money in exchange for equity? We have considered it, yeah, um, many times, to be honest. Doug and I, we are entrepreneurs, and we like we don't want to have to report to anybody is what it, what it boils down to. Um, and we have just decided that it's not worth the stress of having somebody that we have to report to. So if we can figure it out, and even if that means that we grow a little bit slower, and maybe it's not the wisest decision, um, it helps us sleep a little bit more at night. Like I said, I'm 15 years ahead of you. It, it, I, I figured out in my world, better to own a 10 or 15 or $20 million company and make plenty of money to buy a nice house and everything else you want, than shoot to own 30% of a $100 million company and have a phone call on Thursday with some person you don't particularly like telling you what to do. It's like at some point <laughs> you can make enough. This isn't about a lifestyle business either. You can make a fortune doing it the way you're doing and having everything you want and not have to answer to anybody. And I know that 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 goes opposite of what everyone reads these days, but you know, who needs to answer to somebody if you don't have to? Well, tell us about the loan. It, it, it sounds like uh, you chose... PayPal, uh, which I assume is kind of the alternative lender route uh, rather than a traditional bank loan. What, what was the thinking there? Well, the thinking was timing. Um, this transaction ha has been on an unpredictable path in term, and I'm trying to figure out how to mince words a little bit. Uh, it has been so up and down and such a roller coaster. So we needed access to cash within four hours. Okay. And PayPal gave us access to cash within four hours. The bank loan is going to take three weeks. Um, That's incredible. So they have made it very, very simple, very easy. I have mixed feelings about PayPal for sure, just based on our experience, our personal experience with them. Well, it has to be more expensive too, right? No, it is actually not. It's just that you don't have five years to pay it off. They just, every dollar that we take revenue, they take 30 cents of it until it's paid off. So how so much from, kind of interest are you paying? Or they there is no interest. My understanding, Doug set it up, but what he said is there's, I think it was a flat fee of like $1,500. That's what it cost us to borrow this money. Okay, but yeah. that $1,500 translates into, you could call that interest. It depends sure. on the size of, so what, what is $1,500? Is that on $100,000, is that on $10,000? I mean, that's the big difference. It was six figures for sure. A multiple of six figures, but well, that's cheap money. It was very, very, very cheap money. What we'll do is spend the two weeks to get the line of credit through the bank um, reactivated and then just pay back the PayPal so that we have three years to pay it back instead of having it paid back in nine months or whatever that would take. You sold 
people understand a lot of these these companies that say, oh, you don't have to bother with the hassle of the bank and this is easy and fast. Yeah, there's a reason they can do that. It's because people don't understand they're paying 80 percent interest and it's hidden. They say, oh, uh, oh, we'll give you 30,000 and you'll pay back uh, 36,000 in six months. And people think they, that's 20 percent interest. No, it's no. it's 80 percent interest because they're only paying it back in six months and they're paying it down as it goes. So you have to multiply it double twice. And that's why it's so easy and fast. So it's, it's, it's a very expensive borrowing to say the least. So Laura, you've spoken in the past about uh, wanting to enjoy your lifestyle and having a son that you're raising and being concerned about the amount of time that you're putting in. You're now managing three acquisitions that you've made in, in the last um, less than a year, right? Yeah. How are you feeling about that? Uh, um, I am feeling like I am doing what we need to do so that hopefully in a year to two years, I can have the lifestyle to which I would like to become accustomed. Are you hoping to incorporate them into the culture of Jimmy Bean's world? Do you look at them as, you know, their employees are just like the employees you have uh, in, in Reno? Uh, and, and if so, how are you making that happen? Today is my second full day on the job. Um, so we integrated our slacks together. We're sharing photos of each other. Um, we have a trade show coming up in two weeks. So I'm going to bring um, somebody from Madeline Tosh in Texas to the show to meet the team. And then we're going to start working on bringing people from Texas up to Reno once or twice a month, be bringing people from Tex or from Reno down to Texas once or twice a month. And, you know, we'll just do the best we can to integrate um, both technically and in person. So we're on Slack, you know, so we've kind of combined our channels and I've already yelled at the people here and I've, I put a little emoji chart. I'm like, okay, here are all the brands. Jimmy Beans uses exclamation marks. Della Q uses hearts. Um, Namaste uses a flower and Madeline Tosh uses a rainbow. And, you know, we'll just kind of start to learn digitally how we talk to each other so that we understand the tones that we're all using. Karen, you've done... Uh, a, a lot of acquisitions yourself. Uh, what are you thinking as you uh, listen to Laura? I think it's great. I love that she's not giving away equity. Um, and it's the, I've never heard of the PayPal route. And I think it's because we're not in a um, product selling business. So I think that's that kind of funding hasn't been available to us. But we've done, we as well have not uh, taken any VC or equity type of money and have done our acquisitions using a pretty big line of credit at the bank. And so that's based on our receivables. For us, it, it is limited on um, the our capacity to do work. So we can't borrow beyond the work that we're doing, but sometimes our receivables take uh, 60, 90, 120 days to come in. And so that's a long time for, for a cash flow um, perspective to hang on. So the bank helps us ebb and flow with that. And then they gave us a separate acquisition line of credit, essentially, um, based on the receivables of the company that we're buying. I mean, my credit line is based upon receivables and inventory. And generally, from what I see, they usually will give you maybe 75 cents on the dollar for receivables. And the bank hates inventory. So they might give you 25 cents on the dollar for inventory. Karen, how has it gone for you in terms of integrating the operations you've acquired into uh, Blink? Uh, what have you done to try to, you know, build a cohesive culture across these additional businesses? Yeah, it's it's a big full time job for us. Um, so as consultants, we have um, we really want the companies that we've bought, and there's about um, five of them altogether. I think five or six. We want to have one blink quality of service for our clients, and so it's really important that um, we're all speaking the same language. And we make we make sure of that before we even consider acquisitions. And um, similar to Laura, they're, they're companies that we've worked with before; we know them quite well, and so that the integration is much easier in that case. Um, but we have a cultural framework that um, I developed about five years ago, uh, with who's now our chief culture officer. She was a consultant to us at the time. Um, and she helped me develop this framework when we were trying, we were growing from, we were probably 30 or 40 people. And I knew that we were going to start growing more quickly. And I needed a way to describe 
the culture that we had. So you, you could walk in the office and there was a great energy. There was a, there was just a feeling that was sort of a je ne sais quoi and no one really knew how to define it. And we certainly didn't have a language around it and we didn't know how to cultivate it. Um, and so as we got, were about to get bigger, I knew it was important that if we were going to nurture it or, and grow it, we had to have a way to talk about it. Um, we had to have a way to hire for it, to fire for it. Um, and that began with understanding what is it about the culture that's that's causing these people to thrive and um, and feel happy and do great work and give great service to our clients. Um, so we developed this framework and it has six pillars in it. Um, and and we really it's it's the Holy Bible here. So we manage towards it. So all of our management team get training and how to look for these things and how to nurture them. Um, and it's a big part of our hiring as well as our firing. Honestly, it gives us really clear criteria when somebody's not meeting the bar. So w- when we buy a new company, we really start with this. We explain it, and then we start start creating a framework around it gradually for the company. If I'm not mistaken, Karen, you've been buying companies that are based in the U.S., where uh, I'm guessing everybody speaks English. Uh, Laura, what, what's it like dealing, uh, buying a company in Vietnam or, or, or China? Is the language issue uh, a problem? Um, it's not a problem. It's a challenge. I mean, it's exciting. I've been trying to learn a little bit of Vietnamese and a little <laughs> bit of Mandarin <laughs> um, and learn some Hindi because I do a lot of work in India as well. So that's, I mean, I love it. Having to communicate very carefully, you know, and strategically uh, makes me slow my brain down a little bit. And it's just, and actually, when it comes to even product development, what I've discovered is not being able to communicate as quickly and as easily in one language forces me to use other senses, you know, so I have to describe things with my hands and with, you know, it. it's just, it's really forcing more creativity, which I think has been phenomenal. Can we assume that these companies you bought that you were the best buyer because there was a synergy there and you were already using it and it was worth more to you than the other people and that perhaps if you wouldn't have bought it, they might have had a hard time finding another buyer for it. Is Because that's exactly what I did with, I bought a company that makes acrylic frames and I bought it from a guy that was basically closing up his business, but we were selling a lot of it and it it, it worked. Is, Is that the case in your case? 100%. That is a very accurate assumption. You did not make an ass out of you or me. (laughs) (laughs) Laura, you bought a manufacturing company in China. Um, What impact are the tariffs having on you? Oh, they're lovely. (laughs) They are just great. Um, The I am lucky enough that we knew that the tariffs were going to be on the horizon, so I was able to price to the tariffs and incorporate that. That said, I was not planning to wholesale the products and didn't wholesale them for a year or so for many reasons. One was just mitigating risk. Like I needed, I didn't know how to do manufacturing. So I I didn't want to spread this stuff out too far until I understood quality control, until I understood that the products would be good. Um, and then secondly, I just, I didn't know how to do it. Did they approach you or did you sense there was a problem and go to them? With the company in China, they approached me about three years ago, three or four years ago when they closed the business. About two years ago or last year, um, we had made a hire. Our general manager is absolutely phenomenal. And so I finally had a team and had the, so I texted the previous owner and was like, Hey, um, I know you don't have any inventory. I know that the, you know, you don't even have a website anymore, but could I buy this name and could I buy, could I buy it from you? And so we went from there. And then um, the small company that is doing the manufacturing in Vietnam, she approached me um, and said that she was done. And then this yarn company, I approached them. I knew that things were um, tough for them personally uh, and professionally. So I just said, hey, could, could we take over? Like we would love the opportunity. It's the largest and best known hand-dyed company in the U.S. for sure, if not in the world, Um, but just hadn't been given enough attention in the last year or so due to kind of what was happening personally. So I have a team right now that I've never had before that was able, that's able to give it the attention it needs. You've just completed all these purchases. You're still kind of absorbing them, it sounds like. What's the vision? Where, Where do you see this going in three, four or five years? 
the knitting industry, the yarn industry, and as Jay said, a lot of the retail industries are becoming fragmented. Um, and I want to use these companies to do what I can to drive knitting into the forefront of people's minds. You know, I want to continue to make knitting, uh, you know, a household word. And, you know, I told the staff here, I'm like, I just, I want to be creative. I want to have fun. I want us to make things and play. You know, that's what yarn merchandising is all about. It's all about playing. So if we can pay the bill, if we can play and we can also pay the bills and all have a nice life, then that just seems like a win. Amen. As time passes and we keep having these conversations, we will uh, talk some more about how that's going. Uh, but but thanks for sharing. Really an, an exciting time. And I appreciate your uh, letting us in on uh, what you've been going through. Uh, I, Karen, let's... Uh, Let's move on to something else. I asked you guys to think a little bit about uh, talking about something that you've really struggled with. Is there something uh, that, you know, in, in all the years that you've been doing this that you're still trying to figure out? Uh, yeah, resourcing. And I don't think it's ever going to go away. <laughs> I've sort of come to that conclusion. Uh, and for us, that means uh, – assigning people to projects that are a good fit for them that they're excited about that where they'll be successful and doing that back to back year over year with 140 people and the the trick is project teams vary depending on what the project work is they they vary in how many people you need and the skill set that you need and how long the project goes on for some are um some are, you know, a couple of months and some are a couple of years and some are a few people and some are, you know, um, six to 10 people. And for us as a consulting company, we, we bill out our time and, and we're usually billing in fixed fee. Um, but then we have to sort of look at it as, you know, in terms of hours, we need to bill 40 hours a week for each person to pay the bills because when when we're not billing out somebody's time to a client then then we're paying for it and so it, when you add that up you know for multiple hours for multiple people we call that bench time it's extremely expensive for us and it comes really right out of the bottom line and so we're always looking for creative and different ways to manage that and and mitigate it um, with you know, scheduling people. So you want to schedule, they come off a project and then the next day they really ramp back up onto another project. Um, and, but how do you do that with giving people a break and they got to clear their heads? What happens that reminds you this is a, a, a struggle for you? Uh, when it's a daily conversation still after 20 years. With who? Uh, my, everyone in the company. I mean, it's just sort of what we all talk about constantly. You know, I have weekly reports. I have, we have a resource manager whose job it is to do this full time. And then we have general managers who also have to watch out for this full time. Um, and then we have, uh, you know, various other people who are looking at this constantly. And, and particularly, we have a group of people, the most senior people in each of our practice areas. So design, research, strategy, engineering, who are um, assigning the right people on these projects. And so they're also looking like who's available, who's the best fit. And it's just sort of a massive puzzle piece. And so um, daily, it gets, there isn't a day that goes by. I, I think that somebody doesn't talk to me about it in one way or another, or I'm not asking somebody and maybe I could stop asking. <laughs> that might be a better way to do it. But then my CFO is telling me about the numbers. And so that all comes back to utilization. Jay, Laura, anybody got any advice? Yeah, I have to tell you, I'm in a custom thing. And I would ask the question, have you thought about trying to have some product where you could have some engineers tied up on it and when you get busy you can pull them off because i'm in a custom business but i also got into making some stock stuff so that i could handle the flow of i can pull people off of that when we get busy and when we get slow we can build inventory that seems to be you have no inventory to build yeah i mean that's a we do have a, a couple of little products but the trouble is our expertise is in designing products not running and managing and maintaining them and so all of a sudden if we're in a you know, selling product business, it's, it's a different infrastructure that we need. And, you know, we could invest the money to do that, I suppose, but it's feels dangerous to me. We actually have a little product that we spun out into a separate company to, to not put a big liability on our consulting side that we know how to do so well. How about you, Jay? What are you struggling with? On some level, I'm probably struggling with my average person has been here 10 and a half years, but I've got people here for 25 years. And 
I'm at the stage now where I'm kind of hands off and everybody is doing their own thing. Like last week, where's so-and-so? Oh, they're in China. Honest to God, they went to China. You think somebody would have mentioned to me we were sending somebody to China to be buying? It's not a big deal, but I'm struggling with a little bit of the good news is I've got competent people that I give room to and they, they take care of business. But it would be nice if they told me some relevant things once in a while, like they're in China. Well, Jay, I have the same problem. We have we have we do research all over the world, even though our clients are largely in the U.S. And there'll be like there'll be a whole team whole team doing like on the ground field research in India. And I sort of found out about it in the back channel. So I'm like, oh my god! Like, can't you just tell me for fun so I can enjoy all this? <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you, I'm very careful not to make a big deal because like you can't have your you can't have your cake and eat it too. Like I've given them room. I've given them the feeling that it's basically their their job, their company, and they, they treat it like it's their own. And I totally appreciate and respect that. So I don't want to start going, hey, you should have told me about that. So I'm just trying to find a, a, a reporting structure or some structure that um, it's that, you know, I'm in the loop enough. So what did you do when you found out someone was in China? My first reaction was to call the person and go, what the hell? You couldn't tell me? And I didn't. I got to tell you, I didn't. I let it slide. And I was talking to my production manager about a month ago, and he's been with me for 24 years. And I said, Dale, you know, the reality is I'm 75% entrepreneur and 25% manager. And he goes, no, you're not. You're 100% entrepreneur and you're a mentor. And he's right. I don't get into the management stuff. What I should do is simply make sure I discipline myself, which isn't a good word for me, every Friday to sit down with the person for 10 minutes to do it. That's all I would need to do. But I haven't done that. So this is on me. I What I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that once a week I get a 10 minute with them and find out what's going on and, you know, and play manager. We have one big office and then several smaller ones, but um, whenever I'm in the kitchen, I always make sure to ask whoever I see what they're working on and to tell me a little bit about it. And that the insight I get from that alone, and it takes like two to five minutes, is phenomenal for me. It gives me such a great different perspective on the company. It's, it's really awesome. Are you sure you haven't just taught everybody to avoid you in the kitchen? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> part, of the, part of my problem is I've got a production facility that's 15 minutes from here, so I'm not in the same building with a lot of these people, and that's a problem. And if we were, I that I probably would have found out about it. He would have said something to me when he ran into me in the kitchen, but we're not in the same kitchen. Do you have a routine where you go visit the facilities? Yes. Every Friday I go there for the production meeting and I need to just discipline myself when I'm done with the production meeting to go upstairs and talk to the person I'm talking about. And I'm going to start doing that. In the time we have left, I'd like to talk about a, uh, a news item that I think is relevant to each of you since you all have uh, websites. Uh, recently, the Supreme Court uh, declined to hear a petition from Domino's who'd been sued uh, by a potential customer saying that their website wasn't accessible to handicapped people. They took this case, Domino's took this case all the way to the Supreme Court, hoping uh, not to have to adjust their website. And uh, the Supreme Court d declined to hear the case. So uh, that means that uh, it's a, it's a, the decision not to hear the case was a loss for Domino's uh, and for uh, and a win for disability advocates. It means that businesses will have to uh, have to deal with this. Uh, I've I've read a number of stories about the actual litigation, uh, but I have no idea how big a deal is, this is. Uh, whether most websites are compliant or not, how expensive it is. Uh, to make one compliant if it's not compliant. Uh, and I'm curious how the three of you are looking at this. Karen, uh, this, this is kind of the business you're in. Uh, let, let's start with you. What, what's your reaction to this? Sure. I think it's great. I mean, obviously, I, I can see how a corporation doesn't want to be told what to do, but the reality is it's it's absolutely critical and essential. Disabilities don't just include the you know the sort of ones that might come top of mind. It, the, we have a huge aging population. They have trouble with mobility, with, with you know hand and eye coordination. They have trouble um, seeing, hearing, uh, speaking in some cases. And then we have a whole huge population of people who are illiterate, and you know they they like pizza too. So compliant is checking the boxes. Yeah, we've got the alt tags. We've got these various other little things which cost money to implement if you do it after. 
If you do it while you're building a website, it's it's virtually no additional cost. You have to have a plan in place for it. You know, but there's all kinds of things that a, a company like Domino's could do when a huge part of their population, it's delivery service. So they're really, they could be really catering to all kinds of people with various disabilities and really knocking it out of the park and paving the way and having a great example. Could you give us a feel for the uh, the expense here? You said the, the expense is, you know, almost nothing if you build it in when you're building the site. Um, but if you have to go back how expensive is it to to make it compliant or how expensive is it to go beyond that and, and make it innovative in your term? Sure. If you're innovating, you need to do it while designing. So you can't... You can't retrofit innovation. Right. But but because um, that really involves thinking differently, right? How do you solve a, a problem in a different kind of way? Um, but in terms of... I'm making this up, but it's probably anywhere in the range from... I don't know, ten to twenty thousand dollars. Depends how big the site is and how complicated it is, for sure. But if you're going in and just putting in some compliances, that's um, it's different. But it, um, but and I'm sure the price could go way up too. You're missing a piece of this puzzle. The piece of the puzzle you don't have is some law firm sued them. Trust me, this is how it works. This isn't about disability advocates. This isn't. This is about law firms that do nothing but sue everybody who have websites for money. And for all you know, they had a million dollar lawsuit against them. And that's why they went to court. And that's what's going on. with Well, and that's, Lauren, from our perspective, um, as a relatively small business that is online and built our site 17 years ago, and whose chief developer happens to be, you know, my husband and co-owner, the principle totally makes sense. Like, I couldn't agree more. Absolutely, 100%. But this has affected us, like, almost to a personal level, because all of a sudden, the opportunity cost of... Doug has had to spend, it took him three weeks, you know, so that 10 to 20 grand, you know, in terms of development time, well, for a business like ours, that's, that's a part-time employee, you know, that's one person that now can't pull and ship orders or can't take pictures and put them on the site. Um, Doug had to spend two or three weeks trying to figure out what the rules were because nobody could tell him. He went to the ADA site and the ADA site's not ADA compliant. Um, and to learn that the enforcement is not going to be done uh, by the governing agencies, but by lawsuits is really scary. What prompted you to look at it, Laura? Did, we, we, did somebody sue you? or? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we got a letter. We got a letter from somebody and we're a business that's just that size that is visible. I mean, all we need are 10 people to sue us and have to pay five or 10 grand each time just in legal fees just to defend ourselves. Um, That's, I mean, that's a showstopper for us. Did Doug get you where you need to be? He got us where we need to be. But if you think about kind of the opportunity cost of those weeks that he could have spent trying to help us build the business. And again, I'm not arguing. I mean, the principle, it totally makes sense. It would just be really great if we maybe had nine months, you know, or a year to be able to come to compliance and that the government or somebody else would make sure that we were compliant as opposed to having to defend ourselves through the legal system um, and just not having any time. And to Jay's point too, it's, it's sort of sad to think that somebody's running a business on looking for these things and suing people. Absolutely. I mean, we've gotten sued so many times for different things like this, um, you know, that we don't get to build the business. We just are playing defense constantly. So did you settle the lawsuit, Laura? Uh, No, we didn't settle it. I mean, we just got compliant, you know, Doug worked. 20 hours a day. How long ago was this? Um, maybe two months ago, three I months ago. You, I'm not so sure that you're done with that. I've never I'm sure we're that. not. You're going to get a, a letter in the mail and they're going to, and that's how it works. I, I don't think they just did it to be nice. They're going to sue you. Where do you stand, Jay? Has, has this been an issue for you? No, I, 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 had, I actually know a decent amount about this. Most of these lawsuits are coming out of New York and Florida, and there's law firms. This is their new, this is their new cash cow, and they're going after everybody that they can think of that has a website, and then they settle. So did you become compliant? Did you did you get sued and have to adjust? Yeah, but it's frustrating because the government should be regulating this, and they should put standards out there. The problem is, from what I understand, the government hasn't taken really a stand on where they stand with this whole thing with the eight. So there's no rules out there. So all of us are out there doing what we think is right, don't even know about it, and then you get sued and 
to, to Laura's point, there isn't even somewhere you can go that tells you exactly how to do it. It's a gray area. I think I just heard two business owners ask for more regulation. Did, did uh, I hear that right? Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I, was just thinking, I was just thinking that sounds like a great line of business is to like, provide a site that actually will check it for you and help you and totally. give you some consulting. I'm like, huh, right. it's an opportunity. spend $3,000 to a site like that that will go help you do it, then pay it to a law firm who's not doing anything except suing you. Absolutely. You know, with lo- we want to make sure, um, and, and that's our client base as well, and it's just the right thing to do. But, And we will do the work. Just tell us what the work is. And on that note, thank you all for another week of the 21 Hats podcast. We will uh, rejoin this conversation soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening, everybody. This episode was produced by Jess Thubaran, founder of Blank Word Productions. Remember, if you liked what you heard, tell your friends, tell your enemies, subscribe, like us, and best of all, connect with us. Follow us on Twitter at 21 underscore hats and visit us at 21hats.com. Let us know what questions or issues you'd like to hear our panel of fearless business owners address. See you next time.